Welcome to the Physician Associate Podcast. Hello, welcome to this episode of the Physician Associate Podcast. My name is James. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Silo Tabo Deliso, who is a physician associate in paediatric clinical research and also the chair of the Faculty of PA's Research Committee. Welcome to the podcast, Silo. Thank you, James. Thanks so much for joining me. Do you want to start by introducing yourself, telling us about yourself um, and your work as a physician associate? Yeah, I work at Alderhey um, in clinical research and so my role is um, strictly clinical research. Um, there's no uh, element of sort of clinical work except for the ones um, that I sort of incorporate into it myself. Uh, the role's quite new. Um, I think there's been some other PAs that have worked in clinical research before, um, worked in clinical research facilities and stuff like that. But um, there hasn't been any working in, in paediatric clinical research. Um, and also I think like the way that my role is is quite different as well. Um, and it's sort of been looking at how to develop it and how um, a PA can better fit into this space, as well as um, looking at, you know, the the whole thing of physician associates being generalist like how can can that benefit that um that that kind of clinical research space um so for example in my role um what what they what the hospital was looking for um was i guess essentially someone who could sort of like come in and do that kind of work that a clinical research fellow might be doing um but you know, one be more uh, permanent because, you know, clinical research fellows, they're generally there for like a year or maybe a year and a half. Um, and, and then two, it was, uh, it was sort of looking at um, kind of helping to bridge the gap in different ways. For example, bridging the gap between the sort of like nurses and the, um, you know, consultant PIs and things like that, or, you know, uh, potentially from uh, one group of clinical fellows to another group of clinical fellows and and, and different um, things like that. Is this your first job as a physician associate or did you have something more clinical before going into your research post? No, so my first job was working at, um, at the Liverpool, at the Royal Liverpool Hospital uh, in gastroenterology. Um, so that would have been a rotational job um, but just as it turned out is that I got this job before I was due to go into my next rotation. So I ended up not going into the next rotation. So um, I only ended up doing um, gastroenterology. But um, it was sort of like during COVID. So it was more COVID than it was gastroenterology, to be fair. So, um, so yeah, because like the area that I was working in, um, it got turned into a COVID ward. Like one, one of the wards was like COVID ward. Then the other one was like suspected COVID. And then, you know, through the different waves, we went back and forth from being um, you know, COVID wards and normal gastro ward and stuff like that. Yeah, of course. Well, I remember those days well. <laughs> um, I learned a lot from it, and um, there was like quite a good team. And so yeah, so I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. What made you interested in taking up this clinical research post as a PA? Do you have a strong background in research or is it entirely new challenge for you? I wouldn't say I have a strong background. Um, it was more like I was interested in research and I always wanted to do research. I didn't know as much about it. Um, I just, I guess the only way that I knew about doing research was sort of like you know, working as part of a um, university or something like that, or going to do a PhD or MRes or something like that. So I guess my thought was that, you know, I'd work as a PA for a little while and then potentially take a break at some point to go and do some research and then maybe come back. Or if there was a way to sort of like work part-time as a PA and do some research. And so that, that was kind of like my thinking that I was just, I just wanted to see how I could potentially fit research into my career at some point. 
um, just to get to do that. Um, like I never really thought about that or I can work in research as a PA. Like it just wasn't something that occurred to me. It wasn't a, a job that I'd known to exist before this one came up. So obviously when I saw the chance come up, I was just like, oh, you know, it's kind of um we get to achieve like career goals like and you know not have to take a break from working and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. It's quite a unique post as well, isn't it? I don't imagine there are many PAs that work in clinical research at the moment. No, so I think as far as I know, there is I want to say three. So yeah, so it's starting to grow and there's different ways for people to get involved in clinical research. Um, like it doesn't have to be, you you have to look for that clinical research job. Like you, it's definitely something you can do within your regular role. And I guess that's, that's going to be one of the main focuses of the um, research committee with the, with the FPA to try and spread that knowledge of how people can tailor their jobs to include research in them. Yeah, absolutely. It's exciting, isn't it, to think that you can grow the PA profession into incorporating research in the jobs. That's that's really cool. Can I ask you, assume I know nothing about clinical research, assume you're talking to a five-year-old child. <laughs> what do you do day to day so i'm assuming you're not necessarily based in a ward doing ward rounds and those sorts of jobs no so like i mentioned earlier like my job is um purely clinical research except for the sort of um clinical elements that i choose to sort of um, incorporate into um into it in terms of day-to-day it's quite dynamic in that it changes so one day i could be like um in the sort of uh clinical research division area of the hospital um where i'm just like doing stuff on the computer um like doing stuff to do study documentation screening patients um maybe planning a different study or, or planning study visits and you know, um, admin work like that. Um, another day, I could be doing study visits. We have a clinical research facility at Alderhey, um, which it's basically the ward where um, we do study visits and research patients um, come to to do anything uh, that's related with, with research. For example, like if they have to have bloods related with research, then they come there instead of going to phlebotomy. Um, if they need uh, to have like an ECG done in relation to research, then you know they'll they'll come there instead of going to um, whatever, um, the ECG department or whatever. So yeah, so so when when I say study visits. Um, it it just basically covers anything that is just basically a visit to the hospital that is specific to whatever study the um, patient or participant is involved in. Um, so so it, so so the word study visit encompasses like a range of different things. For example, someone can come in and just get their bloods done and go home. And that's a study visit or someone can come in and they might uh, get an infusion of whatever drug um, that is on trial and then stay around and be uh, observed and go and do stuff with physio and stuff like that. And that also counts as a study visit. So, you know, there's, there's a big scope to what counts as a study visit. One day it could be admin, one day it could be me doing study visits, could be me um, going around in sort of like MDU theatres, um, recruiting patients um, so on a face-to-face basis. Um, or other things I do are also uh, help to support students um, with their projects. So I could potentially like meet with them or help them set up or help them um Sort of whatever part of their of their of their research projects that they're on, um, I also 
have this kind of role at the at the hospital where I'm sort of like promoting engagement um, in research activity across you know different staff groups and things like that. So um, some of my time is spent sort of talking to different staff. Um, could be like potentially helping someone find a research project to be involved in, or you know helping them set up an audit, or you know trying to just talking to them, trying to see like how can they um, get involved in research. Maybe they want to come and do some shadowing and, and things like that, which is a whole thing that, that I've done. So um, so it, it varies. It can be just days of one thing. It can be days, it can be a mixture. There's a lot of meetings. Um, so, so to kind of say what I do day to day is... It's difficult because there's no like set structure to my day. It, it, it can vary. It, like it, it can just be like different elements of all those little things that I've mentioned. Because um, I work on a range of different projects across different specialities. I work with different people. Um, and as I was saying to you earlier, um, I've also started doing some work with the um, metabolic team where uh, I'm doing a clinic for them. Uh, every every other week and you know it, it, it can't yeah so it, it, it can it changes from day to day like no one day is exactly the same and you know Tuesday this week isn't the same as Tuesday next week yeah I imagine you've probably got lots of plates spinning all at once in terms of lots of different projects and, and demands on your time so Alder Hay is a children's a pediatrics hospital, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And a sort of centre for pediatric disease and all, and all sorts of things going on. I was just thinking how brave it must be for some of the pediatric patients who must be feeling poorly and, and feeling unwell um, to volunteer and, and get involved with research projects on top of fighting their illnesses. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And um, that's, you know... One of the things that you have to consider when you when you're going to recruit um, some of these patients, and you know you, you're sort of thinking about um, you know the appropriateness of you trying to recruit them in that situation, because there's times when um, we've gone, sorry, we've gone and we've recruited the parents has the parent has agreed, the child has agreed, everyone's happy to take part. But it now gets to the point of, um, let's say, for example, blood's being taken and um, the parent and the child, neither of them anticipated how much anxiety this was going to cause for, for the child. And then you then kind of have to think, um, you know, uh, let's just forget about re- the research for, you know, just get the clinical bloods, forget the research bloods and, you know, maybe another time when um when yeah, things are a bit sort of more comfortable and things like that so so yeah so it's it's a big um element or a big factor to 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 consider the appropriateness of you know when you recruit someone and and it's always nice like to try and show some sort of acknowledgement that you know they have done something that they haven't had that they don't have to do and it's an additional thing. It's not the reason why they came to the hospital or anything like that in some situations. Um, so, you know, in some studies we might give them like a, a certificate to say thank you for taking part or like um, give them like some stickers. <laughs> Children seem to like stickers. So. Stickers <laughs> solve a lot of problems, don't they? Definitely. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you so, need a ready supply of them at all, at all times yeah. with children, definitely. <laughs> yeah, def- definitely stickers make, make make a big difference. Are you able to talk about the general sort of themes of the research projects that you've been involved in, or is that sort of difficult to discuss in a public forum? No, no, um, that's fine. Um, like I said, I work across different specialties, and um, this is the thing that I was saying about how our role is supposed to kind of um, reflect, not reflect, but um, in a way supplement the um, the role that would be traditionally be filled by a clinical research fellow 
um, the way clinical research fellows um, work is that there's a specialty and they focus on um, research for that specialty, but they also have clinical duties. Um, so they may have to do ward rounds, they may have to do like extra clinics and stuff like that. Um, whereas like in my role, where I, I guess part of the idea was that there's no um, sort of constraint where you have to like the clinical team for that specialty are depending on you to be there for ward round or, you know, different yeah. things. So it, it's quite um, spe specific to research in that way. And with um, clinical fellows, like I said, they're, they're mainly for that specialty. And um, whereas I work across different specialities. So currently, um, like I said, I've, I've got a, a project going with the metabolic team, um, got projects with endocrinology. I've got uh, working on stuff in nephrology um, and rheumatology also trying to get into um, some stuff around um, neuromuscular diseases, like uh, in particular um, DM, uh, Duchenne muscular dy dystrophy. So, so yeah, so there's, there's, a, there's a, um, a wide variety of things I do. And then, um, like I said, on top of that is sort of my work with um, sort of uh, trying to get people in the from different staff groups in, engaged in research, which is kind of like a, a project on its own. Um, there's also some um, race equality stuff uh, in research that I'm working on, where um, like our research facility, we're taking part in this um, NIHR uh, sort of race equality public action group um, pilot, where we're basically looking at how we can improve the way we recruit participants onto studies uh, in terms of diversity, because for various reasons, research can be quite exclusionary or it can be quite um, homogenous. Like I said, there's different reasons that, that go into that. Um, things like, you know, the trust that ethnic minorities have, like in, in that kind of field, the historic element where, you know, researchers haven't always been on their best behaviour when it comes to, uh, you know, people from ethnic minority backgrounds and is trying to sort of like partly trying to build that trust and relationship with uh, different community groups to sort of make sure that they understand that research is for everyone and it's better for, for everyone to be involved in research than for people not to be involved in research and trying to demonstrate how that can affect health outcomes and ultimately the, the, the health of the community. Your job sounds fascinating. And um, thank you for pointing out about the sort of racial disparity in research because it wasn't something that I'd considered or, or was particularly aware of. And now you point it out, it seems like a really obvious but really important thing to address in terms of research. Yeah, because the one of the things, because I, I did like a, a staff survey trying to see like in the hospital, how are staff of ethnic minority backgrounds, like how they're engaging with research and the trust and things like that. And one of the things that I would always, an example that I would always kind of bring up is that, uh, you know, SATS monitors uh, that you point your finger yeah. and it tells you your, your oxygen saturations. So they were all tested in the research phase. They were all tested on um, sort of uh, Caucasian people. And because of that, when they're used on um, people darker skin, whether it's Black, Asian or whatever, there can be instances where they, um, they may underestimate or just be inaccurate. They can just be inaccurate in general just because of that difference in the in the hue of the skin so that's like that's like a good example that i tend to use of how research directly affects the you know health impacts because you know if you're not struggling to breathe then you know your your exact sats level may not be as much of an issue 
but if you're struggling to breathe and you know like you're 85 or 82 percent or whatever like that and that's not actually what it is then that's gonna affect you know clinical decisions that are made about your care so it's it's quite an important thing to to try and point out to people that it's not research isn't just about treating people as lab rats it's things that will actually affect you in real life especially like how we've had covid and things like that the the difference of two percent on a on your sats monitor could have been the difference between you being kept in hospital and potentially being told to sort of try and go home and, and ride it out and that just goes to show you like how that situation has now directly impacted um health outcomes yeah absolutely yeah it's amazing isn't it you can i guess in your role be focused on a super sub-specialized quite rare pediatric disorder but in clinical research you can broaden that out to something that will affect all sorts of patients um in all sorts of possibilities like you're saying with with equipment or new technologies or there's so much scope yeah. for so much research yeah so one one of the things that um I'm working on is looking at biomarkers through saliva um, as opposed to sort of serum levels of blood levels. And this kind of goes into why we need diverse samples, because if we're, say, for example, trying to come up with a reference range to say, this is what saliva samples look like in a normal child, then if we only have one group of children being represented in the data, then it's not going to, um, it's not really going to be accurate in terms of like on a global scale. It's, it's going to be useful to people in Liverpool, but when you take that same sort of data set to London or Birmingham or, you know, outside the country hmm. where, you know, it's going to be more diverse, then that data becomes less useful. So not only does it um, impact people here? Is if you want your if you want the results of your research to be generalizable on a global scale, it has to be diverse, and that that's kind of like the um, the sort of underpinning thing, you know, along with things like fairness and you know just it being the right thing to do. That makes total sense. I suppose it's important that the people doing the research as well come from a diverse background so that they yeah. can ask different questions and, and have different opinions amongst colleagues is important in research, isn't it, to consider different viewpoints. And on top of that as well, it's how it also affects how much people from other backgrounds are willing to be involved in research because you just see no one that looks like you or seems like they've had any they can relate to you in, in any type of way you're going to think oh this probably isn't for me whereas like if you can see that oh no even if you don't see someone who looks exactly like you but you just see the fact that actually there's different types of people here so maybe there is a space for me and and, it, and it's, it's that kind of thing and like you said the that whole thing about people coming from different places have different experiences so they will have different opinions and may come up with different ideas that may work better or not depending on the situation yeah absolutely and i suppose the thought just occurred to me being a physician associate and having a sort of permanent job in clinical research as opposed to perhaps the, the doctors as clinical fellows who might have, like you say, a contract for a year or less. It's, I guess, easier for you to plan a bit longer term. You might see the same families and the same kids come back. They'll get to yeah. know you as a friendly face. You'll know more about their research and their trial as things progress. It's, it's probably a really good thing to have you in for the long haul. Yeah, because it's, it's that kind of, you know, the, the the tagline of physician associates when when whenever you're explaining what a physician associate is to someone when you're like, you know, there's continuity of care and all these kind of things. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a perfect example of that um, because 
you know, for some studies, the length of the study may be that they come in and you monitor them like a week in, you monitor them a month in and then a year in and then three years, five years, that kind of thing. Whereas like, obviously, if you've got someone that's going to be gone after, you know, eight, 12 months or something, then like they're not really getting to see that that um, that study through. And it also presents different opportunities for me in terms of that. It's easier to convince people to sort of like pay for me to learn a particular skill or do a particular training because that skill is going to stay there. And then in terms of other opportunities, it's sort of like I can also plan things. So like I say, like I have my own uh, research study that's coming up, whereas like it's, it's taken quite a while from when it was first brought up as an idea. And then I've then gone and I've written the protocol. I've done the, the, the study design of, done all the um, regulatory approval and stuff like that, like uh, ethics and everything like that. And that process to the point of having the green light to carry the green light from the trust to, to then be able to deliver this study, that process has been is coming up to a year. And then in terms of how long it will take to do the study and then um, analyze the results and then write it up and stuff like that. Like if my contract's only for a year, like it's less likely that I'm going to have the opportunity to be able to do that. Whereas like I've been able to do that and, you know, it just makes my job more interesting to be able to, to not also, not, not just like be working on other people's studies, but to be able to set up my own study and, you know, lead that and set up my own projects and lead those. Absolutely. I guess the other part to ask you about was with your connection to the faculty of PAs and the research committee. And do you want to explain a little bit about what that organisation, what that committee is for and, and the work you're doing there? The FPA Research Committee is, like I said, the main goal is showing PAs that, you know, research can be a part of your job like you don't have to wait until there's a job in research for you to go and do a uh, to go and be involved in research research can work within whatever you're doing and that's what our aim is with the um with the FPA research committee and is to sort of help promote physician associates in research let people know what can what can they do what can't they do um what can they not do at the moment, but may be able to do in the future? Or like, if there's something that they can't do, how can they be um, organized that they can do it? Compiling resources and putting them out there for physician associates to access, as well as like, you know, employees that might want to get physician associates on board with, with their research teams. And, and um, yeah, just, you know, make, making those opportunities um, visible and um, accessible for for physician associates. Like the the committee is quite it's in its infancy in terms of that there hasn't been a lot of meetings yet. Um, there's still some things that need ironing out, but we've we've kind of like we're kind of working towards establishing that as a, as a proper thing within the FPA, which can sort of really lead the way in terms of establishing establishing PAs within the research space. Have you got any advice for physician associates if they've heard this episode of the podcast and they think, oh, I want to get involved in clinical research. I want to find out more. I mean, one thing is you can always contact uh, myself. The other thing is to potentially think about the type of research that you want to do and then look at places like you know like the NIHR because they do like fellowships and they do different programs and and all sorts to to help people that are not um, working primarily in research they they do things to help them get involved in research and the fellowships will help cover things like salary and, and stuff like that for the time that you're you're going to spend doing research. 
Um, and then there's obviously like modules and, and stuff like that. But um, but yeah, there's definitely a lot of opportunities um, from the NIHR. There's also um, things like fellowships from um, from specific groups. Um, so for example, like the British Heart Foundation has a fellowship for um, it's for it's for like nurses and allied health professionals, but I think one of the things is just never rule those things out just because when these things are thought up, no one really ever thinks of of PAs until someone asks them and says, oh, can PAs do this? Then potentially the next time they put it out, then they might specifically put that, oh, this also includes PAs. So it's looking at those things that um, they, they may be labeled for, allied health professional or they may be labeled nurse or they may be labeled specifically um, junior doctors or whatever. So I think like it's just to look at those opportunities and don't be put off by the fact that it doesn't mention PAs in there and just um, sort of ring up and call and see if uh, potentially can get involved in um, whatever's being advertised. Uh, I guess I guess the, the third tip is just that um, you know it, it may be difficult, but sometimes it's just sort of providing a proof of concept of how it can work. Um, so if, for example, like you're at work and you don't know how to convince your um, your supervisor or whoever's in charge um, to let you do research, and that you know this is something that you can do within. Um, your work um, within your daily job as well, uh, then it may potentially be going to places like Alder Hay where you can um, show examples of PAs who, for example, work in Gen Peds but are also heavily involved in research or they may work in community but also get involved in research or whatever subspecialty. Um, so, yeah, so it's if... if that's an issue like proof of concept can help to show people like oh this is how it can work because a lot of the time I think most physician associates will know this that a lot of the time people who are not quite sold on PAs are basically that way because they they just can't conceptualize how that will be useful or how that would work and then once they see how it would work, then they're, they're usually on board. Yeah, absolutely. I think you've hit the nail on the head there, that not just in research, but across the whole PA profession, whether you're in primary care, secondary care, whatever specialty you're in. Don't be put off if nobody's done it before. If, if Just because it doesn't say your physician associate on the label, just ask and you'll be surprised. Yeah. Sometimes you'll get a no, but... Once people actually work with physician associates, you, you often find their minds change. You? Yeah, and it's, it's worth, like I said, sometimes you get a no and it may be worth just thinking about a different person to talk to or someone else or like a different pathway to get to where you want to get to. Just obviously just don't give up at the first hurdle, I guess. Yeah, great advice. Yeah, just to keep trying and plugging away. There's usually away with most things isn't it? i think it's, it's it's just that thing of people knowing that you know your interest in research it, it can be part of your job like you can do it as part of your job and just sort of knowing that you know i'm a person that you can contact that like i said all the hey um thankfully is, is kind of um well not kind of it is a trust that's kind of, that's very like supportive of um thinking of innovative ways to work and um it has been very supportive of PAs, you know, kind of uh expanding their reach and doing different things. And um like I said, in various sort of specialties, PAs are doing their normal job and as well as being involved in research. Um if anyone has any questions or anything like that, they can always contact me. Or... Perfect. Thank you. 
And I'll leave your contact details and some of the links to things you've been talking about with the NA, NIHR um, yeah. and other bits and pieces in the show notes so people can find them on their device and get in contact with you through there. That's right. That's right. CeeLo, thank you so much for giving up the time to be on the podcast. It's been great to talk to you. Uh, it's nice talking to you too. Thank you. And if you're a physician associate been listening to this podcast episode, working in some really exciting clinical research, or if you have a really good idea for another episode of the Physician Associate podcast, I'd love to hear from you. Please get in touch with me. I'm on social media at PA Podcast UK, and I hope you'll join me again for the next episode. Thanks for listening to the Physician Associate podcast.